All right, so hello everybody. Uh, this talk is going to be about Firefox OS. I am Sergio Mancilla, as Sam said. Uh, that's my Twitter handle, that's my face in Twitter. Um, that's my GitHub. I do, I code, everything I code professionally and personally is in GitHub, so it's also a nice way to know what I do or what, whatever you want to see about my projects. Uh, previously, I worked at TomTom. I worked at Cloud9 ID, always in JavaScript. Um, TomTom, uh, many, uh, probably some of you had or have a TomTom device. Tom, uh, TomTom devices from 2009 to 2010 were made in, the UI was entirely made in JavaScript. So that's something that very few people know. We had our own ARM uh, WebKit uh, compilation. And it, was, it was quite messy, but it worked really well. Cloud9 ID is, the, is a code ID that maybe you've tried. Right now I'm working on Firefox OS at Komoyo. And this talk is going to be about that. It's going to be very different from Ben's talk. Um, I, I found it very funny that we're in Decode Friday, you know, supposedly to space out from a week of coding, and then we got integer division in V8 <laughs> engine, as, assembler instructions, and see whatever. That, that, was, that was very, very interesting. So um, Firefox OS, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this talk from the perspective of uh, HTML5. So HTML5 and Firefox OS are very well related. How many of you know anything about Firefox OS? Have heard of it? Okay. Okay, not, not, not most of you. So I'm going to explain everything about it, but Firefox OS uh, main feature or main, uh, main uh, point is that everything is HTML5. JavaScript, CSS, and the like, including the operating system. It's not that you make apps in HTML5. The operating system is itself made in HTML5 using the rendering engine of Firefox Gecko. But uh, what happens usually is that nowadays, HTML5 is used everywhere. So you don't know. If, I, if there's an, a talk called it's, uh, that includes HTML5 in the title, I wouldn't go. Because it's, I don't know what's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be um, CSS properties or it's going to be uh, JavaScript or WebGL or whatever. So it's become a little bit like uh, the word cloud uh, lately, which you know is everywhere and doesn't mean what it used to mean anyway. Um, and you don't know what it will stand for. And Dilbert puts it very well in this in this um, comic strip. So first of all, I want to clarify what I will uh, be talking when I talk about HTML5. So HTML5 is mainly a set of technologies and tools. HTML5 officially is a markup language, like the, the next version of HTML4, but I don't think anybody uses it that way anymore. Um, so it's a part of uh, the three most talked about technologies inside HTML5, is CSS, JavaScript, and HTML. This is what you use to build websites or web apps. Right, of course, uh, in HTML5, there's many other concepts like and not, you know, many people think that JS and, and CSS are the most important ones, but technologies that are coming are getting extremely exciting, such as WebRTC, uh, which is going to be groundbreaking when most browsers are implemented, and Firefox, latest Firefox is already implementing it as of yesterday, I think. Um, from SVG to WebGL, I'm sure you've seen all these crazy demos of WebGL, the latest stuff like ASM.js, super fast uh, CPU performing JavaScript, uh, databases like IndexDB, and I'm forgetting cameras, and from, I'm forgetting uh, audio uh, APIs. So it's, HTML5 is actually, and uh, many of you know that, um, it's becoming a platform for development, a real, real platform, uh, a complete ecosystem in which you can develop all kinds of applications and websites. So this is this is becoming pretty popular. Right now, uh, people are using it for websites. People are using it for impressive demos. Um, more and more, uh, you see websites that try to use uh, the new West API, try to do crazy things with from WebGL to SVG to offline, you know, websites that survive when they are offline. But uh, it's funny because this is only happening on desktop. So everybody or every developer on, on desktop browser is seeing like how it's becoming amazing to develop for, for the browser, and they're taking advantage of it, and it runs everywhere. It's a true uh, multi-platform uh, ecosystem, but it's only on desktop, where everybody's moving, or, or all the most users are starting to use mobile more than desktop. And what happens in, in mobile? In mobile, we're not moving 
towards that. In mobile, we are actually moving back to where we were in the 90s, which is the shareware model and every brand like Apple, Google, Blackberry, whoever have their own application platform, very nice, their own wall garden and a place where you don't share anything with any, any other um, device. So what's the main, the main disadvantages of developing in mobile nowadays if you want to develop uh, native apps? How many of you are mobile developers? Okay, about half of you. Um, so the main problem is that you have, let's say, I, I put the main platforms here, have, uh, but in reality, most of it is two, right? There's Android and Apple. So let's say that you're developing this super cool app for your Android. Um, you will develop, you will put all this effort, you will put all this developer, you have to learn the framework, you have to learn the APIs, you, you will spend all this time uh, making it. And when you're done and you release it to the marketplace, provided they, they accept it, um, you, will have, you will make many people uh, happy and perhaps earn some money on the way. Now, you cannot really ignore the iOS users out there because there's many of them. So you want your app to run for them. What are you going to do? Can you port your Android app to iOS? Not really. That's it's Java. You have to learn a new language. If you, don't have, if you don't know it, learn a massive amount of frameworks, APIs, uh, and do it all over again. The only thing you can take over is, is the images and the idea itself. Now, if you want to be really concerned, and let's say you're a big brand or a big company that wants to cover everything, you also have to do that for Windows phones. And if you really want to please everybody, you make it for BlackBerry. That's a joke. Nobody uses BlackBerry. <laughs> Nobody uses <laughs> it for BlackBerry. Yes? Uh, it should be noted, though, that there are um, options for writing once and writing multiple. I'm going to get to that. Yeah, I'm aware. So I'm putting the, the, what the scenario that these brands want us to do. Um, so yeah, between these platforms, there's, uh, you, you, you write once, you run once, incompatible APIs and store restrictions for developers. Whereas this is not a big deal when you're developing for four platforms, it starts being a big deal. You don't know, you present an app, uh, um, they might reject it, they might reject it later, like it happened uh, with some app store stuff. You cannot, you cannot really, you have to agree to the contract they, they put you and pay for it. You, if you're a developer, you pay 90 euros a year or something like this. Anyway. So it's all this, basically they have developed their ecosystem and you're just, if you want to play, you have to play by the rules, by their game, uh, by the rules of their game. So the developer suffers and the user suffers. And the user suffers in the way that this is a screenshot of uh, an application, a pretty popular application for uh, storing passwords called One Password. On the left, there's the iOS uh, app. On the right, there's the Android app. They're very different, and the Android app looks clearly much more shitty. And this is probably because there was a time in which uh, Android was not as important as iOS, and everyone was doing iOS, but then it started being important, but not enough. So developers that were doing iOS apps were like, okay, I'm going to do the Android app or outsource it to somebody, and then they make, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter, you know, the Android users are used to shitty apps. So... <laughs> Um, they, it, it's okay, they will be grateful that they have it, but now it turns out that Android, it's, uh, now it's starting to be there way around, right? The Android users want, want everything nice, uh, so you have to spend all this time making two apps uh, adapt, blend with the ecosystem using uh, all the APIs and, and everybody's expecting the best. So when a company has to divide, a company or you as a freelance has to divide their efforts into so many platforms, into learning so many technologies, it might be cool from the point of view of a developer, but it's not really cool. It's just, it's just shitty, and you produce less quality apps. You have to be aware of too, ma too many other things. Funnily enough, there's a solution nowadays that is HTML5. HTML5 is in every single device you own, except for the toaster. That's the only device that ha doesn't have HTML5 in this picture. So uh, most of you probably have one or several of these devices at home. None of these devices, except for the Mac and the iPad maybe, or yeah, none of these devices runs the same operating system. The Android and the tablet may do. But none, none run the same operating system, none run the same apps, but they can all run HTML5. So why would you do HTML5? What is the, the concrete advantage that HTML5 bring you, brings you? First of all, it's the standard APIs. 
you learn once and you probably even if you're a mobile developer you're doing websites as well most likely so you know many of the APIs and frameworks that are out there um, and these APIs the promise is that these APIs are the same everywhere they might be some browsers like IE that is just behind in some of them but they are catching up fast even them so you know how to program you know how how the APIs work they will work in every device there is less fragmentation in that <laughs> That I found this this morning. It was pretty amazing. You don't want to be that guy. Um, there's less fragmentation. So you have, <laughs> you have uh, certainly there's some browsers uh, that implement some parts of it and, uh, as, or on some other parts they don't. But right now, at the moment we are in time, most of the browsers are up to date. Let's say Firefox, Chrome, Safari, they're all at the same level more or less of APIs unless you want to use something very cutting edge and Internet Explorer is getting there but again we don't care too much about Internet Explorer because nobody uses Windows 8. Um, one really good point for me of HTML5 is that you can use any hipster technology you want. Any technology that is out there, you know, the new framework that you want to use, the very latest framework that is based on, I don't know, animated GIFs, you can use it because nobody, HTML5 is a technology, they don't impose a framework, they don't impose a way of doing things. That's opposite to uh, what Apple or Google do, whereas their frameworks are really well uh, designed and very well architected. If you don't like them, you don't have a way around. You have to do it the way they, they want. So uh, they do MVC frameworks, you're going to do MVC framework. In the HTML5 world, right now, we are having the most innovation that we've had in a while uh, with frameworks like Angular or Knockout. They're coming out with really cool concepts to develop apps quickly, uh, really complex data binding, and you know people are uh, getting really involved with it. So innovation is there, and you can choose what to use. If you want MVC, you have MVC. If you want a functional framework, you have functional. If you want reactive programming, you also have that. Now, whenever you talk about HTML5 in mobile, there's always some bullshit arguments that come up. So, bullshit argument number one, and it's not false argument, it's bullshit, which is slightly different. The first one is performance. So, native versus HTML5 in a phone. Native is faster, and that's true. That's completely true. Um, doesn't matter, not really, for 99% of, of apps. Um, some time ago, some two months ago, Mark Zuckerberg came out on some TV or some show and said, like, uh, we are reverting to native for our Facebook iOS app because HTML5 is not ready yet. And regardless of what he meant at that moment, the, the words were taken out of context and everyone, all the technical press and everybody was going crazy about how HTML5 failed and now it's all native world and stuff. Um, one, week, uh, one week later, Sencha, which is a JavaScript uh, company, made this Facebook app that you can download for your iPhone. And this Facebook app is on the right, the native Facebook is on the left. They managed to make it actually faster with uh, exclusively HTML5. So what happened there? Why, why could they and, fa and Facebook didn't? Because Facebook um, developed the HTML5 app like they develop a web app. So there's this thing about web development. Is that everybody knows some part of, or so, uh, to some extent, some uh, web development, right? Everybody knows how to make things show up in JavaScript and how to you know, uh, move things along the screen. But very few people know how to make it really fast. What are the performance bottlenecks? How, what are you doing wrong? What, are, what is a CSS reflow? And this kind of stuff. Um, the thing is, nobody applies that. And in Objective-C, for example, in order to get to uh, make a, an iOS app already, you have to go through some hoops. You have to do memory management. The, the barriers are higher. Uh, the barriers of entry are higher, so people know much more about how to optimize and stuff. Um, they made it as fast, and it's, so it's completely possible. The other demo that you might have seen um, in the last weeks has been uh, the Unreal Engine ported to JavaScript. So what is happening here is this, this is just JavaScript, a subset of JavaScript called ASM.js that is in Firefox already. Um, so 
this is uh, um, mscript and compiled JavaScript. So it means that it's transcompiled from C to, to JavaScript and it runs like this. And this is uh, already on the Firefox devices and it's in Firefox OS devices already on the, on the latest, um, latest mo uh, operating system in, in Firefox OS. So this, can, this is possible today. This is already possible. So what is your app doing if it's doing it's probably doing something like this. Maybe it's doing something like this. In both cases, you can reach that performance. It might take a little bit more effort than in, in native apps. Yes, but it will run anywhere that these technologies are supporting. Yes? What about memory? Memory. Memory consumption. Well, it's higher. Higher than native apps? Well, it depends. Um, I guess so. It's higher. But it depends, I mean, it, well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you should com consider it as, as in how you develop in desktop, right? So is it, if you do an equivalent JavaScript app to a native app, it's likely that it's going to spend some more memory um, because it does, you know, garbage collection and all this. You, you don't have a fine grained control. So let's say if you develop for iOS, you can, you decide when to allocate memory and when to release it. If you develop with JavaScript, you don't really. The engine decides. So it's the same scenario. So Objective-C, Objective-O, is garbage collector? Uh, I think you can manually do it and has a garbage collector. But I'm not an expert. So um, the point is, I think it's, it's my, my belief, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's the right belief, <laughs> is that design of the apps is much more important than the underlying system for most cases, unless you need you have very special needs. Anyway, let's move on. Um, the bullshit argument number two is actually um, JavaScript itself. So JavaScript is a very controversial language. People either love it or hate it. There's no really midterm. Um, so the, usually the, the people who hate it are people who come from other uh, background languages and usually from statically typed languages. So if you come from Java, if you come from, from C and you start programming JavaScript, everything looks like chaotic. And it looks like you cannot program really big apps because it's, it's this dynamic typing and it has all the, I don't know if you've gone to this what the fuck JS uh, website. It's very fun. It tells you about all kinds of extreme cases of JavaScript in which you can, you know, make, uh, add two numbers and you get a string and shit like that. <laughs> um, or the typical, uh, the type, there's, there's a type in, in JavaScript that is not a number, uh, which, whose type is actually a number. So you have, you have all these what the fuck, every language has it, JavaScript has it a lot. Um, so people revert to that, and uh, it's, it's, it has a prototypal, prototypal inheritance, so that confuses a lot of people. Anyway, JavaScript, for whatever reason, is, uh, um, is very powerful and very hated at the same time. The thing is, you are not even limited to JavaScript anymore to program apps. These are only the top alternative language for JavaScript right now. That means that these languages, are they all compile to uh, readable JavaScript. You have you probably heard of Dart or CoffeeScript. Dart, if you're a Java programmer, Dart will feel uh, comfortable. If you're a Java programmer to uh, TypeScript, will feel, will feel comfortable, or a .NET programmer. If you like Ruby, you'll be happy with CoffeeScript. If you like uh, Clojure, you'll be happy with ClojureScript or any functional language. All the other ones, oh, yes? What about Python nerd? What? I'm a Python nerd. Which one of those would I like? There's a Python, a Python, there's one, version of Python that compiles to JavaScript. Um, I didn't put it here, but now I'm, I'm getting to that. Uh, sorry for the Pythoners. Um, I'm sure, I mean, the Pythoners are very smart. I'm sure you, you, can, you could handle that. Uh, anyway, uh, Hacks or Roy, um, Wisp, these are functional languages, but they are, they, all these languages are not just some hobby programming language. Objective-J for Objective-C programmers is almost the same. This is not just hobby languages that someone creates, they're really well supported and very developed and they're getting a lot of traction. Um, I went to alljs.org and I executed that on the JavaScript console to get the amount of languages that right now compile to JavaScript and it's known. And that's 269 languages that compile to JavaScript. 
if you want to know the names, you just add this after, after that bit of code. But that's to say that if you definitely hate programming JavaScript and this is your blog is to, to make really good apps, there's a lot of solutions and very well supported and, and maintained ones. And for the last bullshit argument, the looks. This is something that almost everybody agrees. When you have a mobile app, uh, a mobile HTML5 app, it always looks like crap compared to the iOS app, right? And it's true, and I agree with that. Most, mobile, mo most HTML5 apps on mobile look shitty compared to, to the iOS or Android app. But why is that? That's because there's not enough effort put on it. If you look, this is forecast.io. I didn't put the URL, stupidly. Um, this is a web app that I can show you after in, the, in, in an iPhone. This is a web app that you would never ever say that this is a web app. It's fast, it's beautiful, it's, the transitions were perfect, it works great. Um, what's, the, what's the difference with other web apps? The guys that did that web application, they just decided to make it performant and nice and they put extra effort. Usually, mobile websites are an afterthought. You know, people just make the liquid layout, make it fit, and okay, it can be seen in a mobile. Okay, we're good to go. But they don't think about interface, they don't optimize content, um, assets for compression, and they don't, they don't pay attention to the animation, so it always feels kind of crappy. It just doesn't have to be like that. Now, there's real arguments. So the main argument uh, for against HTML5 is that, okay, I can make this great mobile apps. You convince me with all this, with all this talk, and I'm going to start, but I want to access the accelerometer or the camera, and I want to take a picture from, with the camera, send it over, uh, use the email client, and all this. And you cannot do that because you don't have access to the underlying hardware of the phone. So that's a problem. Now, as you were pointing out before, some people have tried to solve that. And these, the two main guys are PhoneGap and Accelerator. These are both uh, frameworks, uh, build frameworks that compile, not compile, but um, wrap your app, your HTML5 app, into an application that runs in all devices, in iOS, in Android, in whatever is implemented. This is great, and PhoneGap's, PhoneGap's main mission or main motto is that their objective is to disappear. Their objective is to, for someday to not have to use PhoneGap to, to make your app work in all devices. But there's many disadvantages. To begin with, Absolutator is, is uh, you have to pay for it, so forget it. PhoneGap is pretty good, um, but PhoneGap can't avoid being behind the main, uh, um, the main phone maker. So when iOS 7 comes out with all these new frameworks and APIs, PhoneGap has to start working like crazy uh, to make you know, the equivalent to these APIs to be able to access, to, to access them. Um, and that, you know, keeping in mind that Apple at any time could make an API not implementable or just for signups or whatever, and then PhoneGap cannot implement it. Also, it's, a, it's an extra layer. So even if these are nice guys and it's open source and all, you're subject to their decisions about uh, adding new APIs, keep, um, taking off other APIs, and um, compatibility with previous versions. So basically, you rely on an intermediary between you and the final product. And perhaps the iOS app works perfectly, but you cannot use that API because the BlackBerry or the Android app that is, not, is not there yet. So you know, there's many things that don't feel right. And you have an extra build step and an extra technology. It's a lot of things. So this is getting ridiculous at the point. And every, Google and Apple are going, uh, are, have parted ways with APIs and all this. Question? Yeah, I know that. I mean, that, that's great, but this is still HTML5, right? It's in the... HTML6. Well, okay, yeah, I know what you mean, but it's still, it's still built on top of HTML5, so you, you need the underlying technology, right? So, anyway, Mozilla realized of that. Um, you, you know Mozilla, probably. So, remember the 2000s. What happened in the 2000s? We were in a very similar situation as of now. There was Internet Explorer 6, uh, just just released in 2001, I think, and it was a shit. I mean, Internet Explorer 6 was very innovative. Uh, 
it had virtually no competition. Netscape was going down. And developers were kind of happy. They were using their ActiveX controls and all this uh, new, new stuff that they, that they came up with. So everybody was like, I remember I was working at a company, at, at a web company at that point, and we basically, we kind of put some effort on the, on the Netscape part, but you know, who cares? i6, everything works in i6 and nowhere else. How have things changed? And, uh, but then developers were happy, as they are happy now developing for iOS or Android, um, because they are like, no, it's fine, it's comfortable, it's a great framework, it works fine. But what happened there is that this monopolistic situation was eventually not good for users or developers. Um, Microsoft took, what, 10 years to update their Internet Explorer, and only because it was forced by all the other browsers, nobody, everybody was starting to not use it any, anymore. So APIs get old, they start uh, deviating from standards, they start doing whatever they want. So Mozilla came up with uh, Firefox at that point, uh, called Phoenix on the first incarnation, <laughs> and it took like two years to overtake uh, Internet Explorer in, in speed and, and, uh, and other stuff. And people started using it and Firefox eventually became an important browser that gave way to Chrome and Safari and all the other browsers by taking the monopoly away from Internet Explorer. And now web developers are, are kind of grateful uh, about that. And we wouldn't go back to an Internet Explorer only culture, but nevertheless, we're going to a uh, iOS, Android exclusive culture um, in, in phones. So, to my main point, this is Firefox OS. How does Firefox OS make that different? Um, Firefox OS is a completely new operating system, leverages open web, and by open web means web API standards, and there's no wall gardens, which means um, that the marketplace doesn't enforce particular uh, um, restrictions and you don't even need a marketplace after all. So if you remember, someone did that before, tried to do that before, and that was Palm with WebOS. And WebOS was an amazing operating system. It was really good, really ahead of its time. Um, fortunately, it was too ahead of its time because hardware was not there um, to back up a whole JavaScript operating system. It was some years ago, but it was enough for JavaScript engines to not be that powerful, as powerful as they are now, and for the hardware to be much worse than what is now. So it was, it was low, it didn't feel like, like other phones, but their main mistake was that they had their own APIs. So they were like, yeah, you can program uh, web apps as you always have done, and it would just run. And that's not completely true, because you still have to learn how their APIs to access the hardware works. So, and that's only Palm, that's Palm exclusive. They didn't enforce or they didn't uh, push any standard for it, right? So in the end, you were also trapped in their, in their way of seeing things. Now, Mozilla started this whole effort by proposing a lot of web, web API standards to the W3C, which how many of them have already been approved. So for example, the Chrome, uh, Chrome has, uh, is adopting some of these web APIs, like Vibration API is already in Chrome. Other, Browsers are already uh, uh, preparing for it, and the W3C is, is, is accepting them as we speak. So that's one important thing. The main thing about Firefox OS that is a Trojan horse. The thing, uh, Firefox OS is not the end. Mozilla doesn't want to sell a lot of Firefox OS just to sell a lot of Firefox OS. Uh, what Mozilla wants is that by making pressure with Firefox OS and making users use it, um, everybody else will have to adopt the standard API, web APIs, which is what they did with Firefox. Firefox was very hard to ignore at some point, so other vendors had to yield and use standards as well. And when, the, when they use standards, everyone wins. So they're trying to do the same. And how do you develop for Firefox OS? What is this website thing? So you basically take any website, any website is already an app, so you've all done a Firefox OS app, although a pretty crappy one, probably. So any, any website is already a, a, an app. So let's see. This is a very valid Firefox app. This, I'm sure that you can all recognize the code. It's just a normal HTML page, and then you have a script tag that adds an event listener in JavaScript, the same JavaScript that you always use to add event listeners, and it listens for an event called device proximity. Whenever this, events, uh, this event calls the function, uh, the function looks as if that, uh, to see if that value is uh, less than 10, 
And if it is less than 10, uh, the, it vibrates. So that means that if I take a Firefox phone on that web page and I put it close to me, it will vibrate when, it's, when the phone is close to my body. That's how you do that in Firefox OS. That's the, that's the API to do that particular case. Of course, you'd, you'd need that HTML page and uh, manifest.webapp, which tells the phone how to, uh, how to deal with that. You tell the icon, uh, you tell names and stuff like this. You ca this manifest web app can be massive. You, you can also specify permissions and this kind of stuff, but that's all you need. That's an app already. That the system will recognize. So uh, the regular APIs that any app or website can use at any point um, are those. You have from vibration to geolocation, uh, index DB, uh, ambient light sensor for whoever wants to do fancy stuff, notifications, and I pointed out the ones that are already approved by the W3C, and all the other ones are being studied uh, right now. Then, of course, you don't want uh, people to, you know, just go to a web app uh, so, and people just uploading your context to some website. So if you want to do that, you need to do a privileged app. A uh, privileged app is just an app that you submitted to Marketplace and specifies what privileged APIs is going to use. Um, these are the four or five privileged apps that you can, that you can use right now. Uh, APIs, sorry. Uh, device storage, browser, you can use TCP sockets uh, directly from JavaScript, contacts, and, and system exit jar. And in the end, there's certified APIs, which right now are only used by the core apps in the system, which are, these are, these are the fun ones, or the most powerful ones. This, this is the one that, uh, from which uh, apps can send SMS, uh, use the camera, uh, access Bluetooth and all this kind of stuff. Of course, as you have to be certified app for that and you, because you're using certified API, so you have to be a central, uh, a, a central app of the, of the system or a third-party OEM can embed it. But in the future, users will be able to apply for this as, to, as well. So I want to show you a little bit more because you're uh, all developers or almost all developers, how um, other APIs work. Um, if you want to show a notification in the phone, that's how you do it. You get the most notification object, create notification, you pass three arguments, title, the description, and the icon if you want, and that will pop up a nice notification in the phone. That's it. You don't need anything else at all. You don't need to be in any context, in any framework you don't need to use to create any weird objects. That's just normal JavaScript. If you want to send an SMS, it's one line, effectively. Uh, navigator MOS SMS, send the number, the string that you want to send, and then you can attach an unreceived event to react to when you know that the, the SMS has been sent. Vibrate, this is fun. Um, the vibration one, this was, this was called actually the vibrator API at the beginning. And <laughs> imagine Mozilla is full of like, let's say 3,000 nerds all day long talking about the vibrator API. That was, it got really <laughs> annoying. So now it's called the vibration API. It's subtle, but it works. Um, you'd pass arguments to, to navigator.vibrate. Uh, you can pass, like, the first one vibrates for one second. The second one makes a pattern uh, that you can do. You can, you can come up with any crazy patterns. Uh, five seconds, and the last one stops vibration by putting it to zero. Um, that's how you set permissions. So if you are going to use some sensitive APIs, you just declare it in your manifest that I showed before. And you, you, you say like, okay, the permissions are gonna be the following. I'm gonna use geolocation and SMS access. That's how it works, nothing else. The, then the, the system knows already that you are gonna use that and nothing else. Um, the cool part of developing that way is that you get to use the same developer tools you use for the web. And it turns out that the developer tools that come with the browsers lately are getting really good and everybody knows how to use them already because you've used them in the past. So all the uh, code inspection, HTML inspection, CSS, uh, real-time editing of the pr running program, like changing variables, monkey patching, all this stuff that you do, you can do it anyway uh, with a Firefox app running in your phone. That is really cool. You don't have to recompile the program and see how it looks now. Oh, shit, I forgot that. Okay, let's modify, let's recompile. You can do it right away in your, in your browser. It's really cool for developers. So, of course, you don't need a phone to develop. You can start right away. Literally, um, if you have a Firefox browser, 
which uh, many of you might not because Chrome is pretty cool, but Firefox is getting really cool, the desktop browser. Anyway, just if you um, go to the, to, if you look for simulator in the add-ons page of Firefox, you will, you will just get the, the main Firefox OS simulator and you can already uh, run apps. This simulator runs the exact B2G, uh, which is the Gecko version of Firefox OS. So it's uh, whatever runs here, it will run exactly the same in your, in your uh, phone. So, and it comes with the whole operating system already and you can try and experiment and start developing. You don't need anything else. You just, not, you just need a browser, download the simulator and you're ready to go. Um, of course, if you're ready to go, it's fun, but you know, starting from scratch sucks. So at Komoyo, we've done uh, some scaffolding in this, you can find it in this URL. And we, we made an Angular app that already makes a typical list app and you can start from here. I know that I, I say that because many people start and like, oh shit, now I have to do the whole UI and use the styles and you know, you get lazy and you don't do it. So um, there's scaffolding, there's many more resources than that, like an insane amount. One of the cool things that Mozilla made is prioritize documentation. So if you know nothing about Firefox OS and you go to the website, everything is documented. It's like, I never find parts that I doubt or that I don't understand that are not documented already. Um, about the marketplace, I didn't talk too much. Uh, the marketplace is like an app store, but the restrictions are almost zero. So they are not uh, picky and they are not crazy about it. There's, there's a whole document, but I won't get into details. Um, and you don't need to be in the marketplace to make your app popular uh, or to, to sell your app even. You can have your own marketplace. You don't have to be in it. You only have to be in the marketplace if you touch uh, sensitive APIs. Uh, obviously, uh, it would be too dangerous to let anybody host their own apps and you know do really nasty things. But uh, you don't need to use their marketplace, and it works in a different way that uh, the Google or Apple one. I think it's a thirty percent cut, whatever. But uh, it's getting exciting because there's all the main guys, Twitter, Facebook, and all these guys have already done apps. People are creating apps very fast because in the end it's just JavaScript and HTML, CSS. So um, yeah, it's a it's a cool concept. The next one is that it works on Android. So if you have an Android phone uh, and you install the Firefox OS browser in Android phone, it can run web apps uh, with the Firefox OS web APIs. That means that if you use the, these uh, APIs that I just showed you, how to access camera, vibration, and stuff, if you load it in Firefox OS, it will access your Android uh, native Android functions. Is that an app, or are we talking about the Firefox browser? The Firefox browser, ah, okay. yeah. If you Okay, then uh, it's, it's a Firefox browser in Android. It can run web, web apps and it has a very up-to-date web API. So that's cool. Um, yes? Is the Firefox browser in iOS also going to do this? It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist? No. Is it going or? No. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> Apple, Apple doesn't, doesn't like this kind of stuff. Exactly, but the thing is that uh, the, the main thing about uh, Firefox OS and web APIs is that they're in the Gecko browser. Apple only allows you to implement a browser if you use their WebKit browser. So Chrome in iOS is not using V8, and it's not use, or no, it's not using V8 or the rendering engine that Chrome uses. Yeah. Chrome on the, in Apple is just a very nice wrapper around the WebKit, serial WebKit. So Firefox could make a browser, but it won't have any of the of all this, so it, 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 there's no point. Um, yeah, Apple will be hard. Um, I don't think Apple likes all these or cares. But if there's enough pressure with web APIs uh, becoming important, and another thing is that uh, you know there's this weird thing about Google, and it's like uh, Android is not very Google. They created it, but Google is the the company that bad, you know, they are, they are all about the web. The web is their real, the web is what they believe in, and Android is not really in the web. At the same time, they're making the Chrome OS, which is a HTML5 operating system, which is kind of same concept as Firefox OS, but they have this Android and Chrome OS going at the same time. They don't really know what they're doing, and Android is not bringing that much revenue to, uh, to Google. So, and they are starting to implement this API, so I think that Google will, <coughs> shift eventually to a more web-based uh, operating system. At least they are, they are, they are friends and they like uh, the whole initiative in, in Firefox OS. 
Um, so yeah, for now, uh, your iPhone won't be able to run that at all. Um, yeah, last slide, just more, uh, no, not last slide, one before the last. But uh, there's a developer hub in the marketplace uh, page. And this is awesome because it has a designed, built, and published section. And there's a lot of resources for each, for each part. Like if it tells you how to do icons, how to make the layout, how to do everything, how to uh, access APIs. Like there's all kinds of docs from zero to the end of the app, not only about APIs or, or development stuff. And we at Komoyo, we made uh, a GitHub uh, page in which we explain how to, how to uh, set up your device once you have it. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot of documentation from us about how to get up and running. Uh, things that we missed at the beginning when we started developing. So the resources are there uh, and it's very exciting. And I'll, I'll be passing around a Firefox OS phone now if you, if you, if you want to try it and see how, how it feels and how it is. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I got. Yes. It's already out there. I mean, there's developer phones, which have been there for some months. Mm -hmm. And Sam has one. I have some here. Where do I get one? You buy it. Cheap. How much? Geeksphone.com. <laughs> uh, Geeks, the Geeksphone are the developer's phones. So these are not the ones that are going to be in the market. They're just for developers. There's, there's one at 90 and at 150. There's two models. Yeah, there's two models. This is the cheaper model. Yeah. So, and this uh, base hardware for like uh, 90 dollars, you say? 90 yeah, years. I mean, oh, one thing I didn't say is that Firefox, so the funny thing that whenever you talk about Firefox, the first thing that you, you always get asked, Firefox OS, is like, oh, how is it going to compete against Android or iOS? I mean, this is, and if you try the phone, it's like, oh, that's clearly not an iPhone. So, what F Firefox OS is designed, uh, at least at the beginning, to run on really low-end phones, like super low-powered, because uh, Firefox is trying to deploy millions of phones into second world countries that are just upgrading from uh, feature phones, the so-called feature phones, into smartphones. Firefox OS will be the first phone that they have. So it's not competing against iOS, against iPhones, or against high-end Android. Low-end Android, uh, are much worse than Firefox OS. Firefox OS is a very lightweight system that runs really fast on low-end devices. So the main wave or the, the first year wave of Firefox devices will be on low-end hardware. That is to say, like, don't try to take one of these phones and compare it with an iPhone because it just it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, but in the future, there will be, and they're even creating a tablet now uh, with Foxconn. That I, I don't know when it's going to come out. Um, No, no, it's much, much less than that because uh, telcos are financing a lot. For example, the one that we're going to take out in Serbia, I cannot say the exact price, but it will be around 50 euros. Uh, and it's this one, the Alcatel, which is it's a pretty nice phone. Actually, I use it as my work phone. And um, for 50 euros, it's extremely worth it. Also, for a developer, is I mean, it, we're talking also the users will be happy because of the price and all, but developers, there's the, the barrier of entry for developing on these things is so low that it's, it's kind of a joy. You know, you connect it to your computer and it's just, you have stuff working already. You don't have to learn much. So it's fun. Yes? I don't know if you've heard of the Paracom since Yeah. I don't know. I just heard about them on uh, like two weeks ago, and I'm emailing with the with the guy there, and I wish I can I can meet them soon. I don't think they're they are doing anything with Firefox, but surprisingly enough, the Fairphone is very high end. It's very nice. Yeah, it's, it's basically equivalent of the next scale. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Um, it's yeah? yeah, yeah. I I I like it. I like the initiative, but no. I, as far as I know, they don't have anything to do with Firefox. Which is a shame. Yes, you can. Um, there's many models. It's like, it's like uh, jailbreaking Android. 
there's models indeed which works out of the box and some others that you have to work a little bit more but the main Android phones have already been worked on there's instructions so I think Nexus uh, all Galaxy is not the 4 yet they have been all hacked and, and they have been modified to run Firefox OS so you can follow instructions for many of them there's others that is super hard and not worth it so you'll, you'll have to see your case depends on what you have yes uh, Yeah, it was. Did you guys get a chance to look at it or take the good parts? Or yeah, I looked at it. Um, I don't think Mozilla did. Uh, they wanted to start from scratch. Also, web, at the WebOS times, they didn't have the same JavaScript that they can use now in Mozilla. So now we can take advantage of, of, of the newest JavaScript, ES5. ES5, yeah. Um, they have a really fancy uh, framework, and it's really cool. But I think it would have been more work to just take that and adapt it than not start from scratch right. but it's really cool uh, and I think that there's some companies using it even for for mobile apps it's worth for looking at it. For my second question uh, what is the kernel composed of for Firefox OS? Is it uh, ripped off a, like a popular Linux distribution? Right? It's an Android. The, it's based on Android? Yeah but that's that's the kernel is extremely small and that's the boot up process is Android so, and the main kernel the kernel is 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 Android and then directly, so there's three layers. There's Gonk, which is the name of the kernel, uh, which is based on Android. Then there's Gecko, and then there's Gaia, which is the JavaScript UI layer. Um, all the Android kernel does is access to hardware and all this, but uh, and boot up Gecko. And that's actually one of the points where it makes it much faster than Android in low-end phones, um, because Android has to, needs much more memory because it has a JVM. Yeah, yeah it has to start a JVM. The amount of memory that the system needs is uh, around half of what an Android will need on the same conditions. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's fast and it's good for low end phones. Yes? What about porting native applications? Say you want to port uh, Quake 3 or Node? Is that possible? Which one? Uh, Quake 3 or just Node.js? You can. I mean, uh, through mscripten, you can compile into JavaScript uh, officially. Right. But it's not possible to install actual native applications. Yes, I mean you could hack your way in, but not not out of the box, no. Yes. Can you receive push notifications? Uh, yes, not in your version. <laughs> in my version, you can. I can I can show you how to upgrade. <laughs> so it's a software version, not a hardware issue. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, with the mass uh, in front of one SMS and, uh, and, and something else. Yeah. Um, normally, that is uh, kind of an indicator of um, um, something that has not yet been standardized and uh, hopefully will be sometime in the future or so. Yeah. Um, is there a plan to standardize these uh, uh, things? It, it, or, well, besides the plans, there are process running to, to, to get to there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, standardized SMS API or so? Yeah, as soon as, I mean, every API that gets standardized by, by W3C gets the, prefi the prefix removed. It, it, that's just policy. If it hasn't been standardized, it keeps the prefix. Yeah, but that, that is going on. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, that's, the process is, is... Well, yeah, it's happening. It's happening. Okay. And APIs are and getting and in. And other vendors agree. Yeah. Apple agrees too. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I just want to... Yeah, yeah, it, it agrees. I mean, Apple, Apple mainly doesn't care. Um, and it's, it's a standard for devices that support HTML5. Yeah. So they kind of are okay. They just say, like, we don't, we don't, we don't give a shit. I mean, sure. Yeah, I mean. And, and then I wonder, um, you said that um, when um, uh, the other guy uh, asked about why Firefox is not on iOS, you said that's because we can't have our own rendering engine and Chrome just uses WebKit. Yeah. Okay, but Chrome does manage to kind of uh, well, improve on what's available on iOS even while uh, it's using limited to the WebKit rendering engine. I mean, how important is, is the rendering engine per se? Also in context of like uh, delivering or uh, uh, enabling a certain API, would mm -hmm. it be possible to uh, like uh, uh, create um, well, just a, a user land library uh, even, which kind of uh, like a, a, works as a ponytail to no. uh, no, it's yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, the you can do the No, but I, I think <laughs> in, in the context of uh, there there already is phone gap, so there is a capability of uh, with a trick to uh, kind of communicate with uh, the, the, the native uh, functions of uh, of the operating system in iOS. 
So then I wonder if you can use that, uh, like the phone gap technique for bridging uh, JavaScript and native. Well, yeah. Um, and, like, uh, deliver the same standardized uh, APIs to have this MOS SMS available via the phone gap trail. But then uh, Firefox would have to be okay with using the WebKit browser that Apple provides. Yeah, I mean, so PhoneGap is doing it. So there's two parts here. One is whether Firefox can make a browser in iOS. And maybe they could, but they are not interested in that part. The other part is PhoneGap is doing that, actually. PhoneGap is adapting the web APIs. So if you program in PhoneGap, you can target uh, web APIs. And that would work. Uh, and they are working on that right now. But yeah, I mean, the problem is when you try to hook into uh, I mean, if you did it, you could perhaps do it in user land. Um, I'm not even sure. But it will certainly, the, the, us the user experience will be dreadful. But PhoneGap will bridge it for now until it becomes more standard. Is PhoneGap interested in like, um, um, supporting the same, uh, enabling the same kind of APIs that you, you are uh, pushing? Also yeah, yeah, yeah. They are, they are totally, PhoneGap actually wants Firefox to succeed to go away. PhoneGap wanted web APIs for a long time. That's their main point. Yeah. So they're, they're so really collaborating. So I suppose that, that is mainly like, a, which is called the Cordova team, no, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. OK, so the Cordova team would rather see it. Yeah, they like it. They love it. OK, it's kind of a, <laughs> well, let's say, what's this called? Um, um, Fatalistic. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you, sir.